The Pro Wrestling Almanac Podcast. Celebrating professional wrestling from yesterday, today, and tomorrow. For wrestling fans, by wrestling fans. Hey everyone, and thanks for tuning in to episode 16 of the Pro Wrestling Almanac podcast. On this week's episode, we will discuss Anthem stating that they are not pursuing trademarks on characters, and this opening the door for Matt Hardy's broken brilliance. Longtime WWE employee Jim Johnston has been released from his contract, and Sexy Star is at it again. Plus, WWE Studios is expanding into TV and digital content production and Vince McMahon's comments on it. For our Ghost of Wrestling Pass segment, we will cover Monday Night Raw from September 22, 1997 from Madison Square Garden and our Indie Spotlight segment featuring West Coast Wrestling Connection out of Salem, Oregon. But first, it's time for the Wrestling Results Roundup. Wrestling Results Roundup. Here are the results from this week's televised shows. On NXT, Ruby Riot beats Sonya Deville, and United Kingdom champion Pete Dunn beat Johnny Gargano. On Impact Wrestling, Eddie Edwards, Richard Justice, Ali, Garza Jr., and Falaba beat KM, El Hio del Fantasma, Chris Adonis, Laurel Van Ness, and Caleb Conley in a turkey suit match. On WWE Main Event, Grand Metallic beat The Brian Kendrick, and Apollo Crews beat Kurt Hawkins. On Ring of Honor TV, Silas Young beat Jonathan Gresham, and Hangman Page, Marty Skrull, Matt Jackson, and Nick Jackson beat Flip Gordon, LSG, Scorpio Sky, and Shaheem Ali. On WWE Raw, Seth Rollins beat Cesaro, Samoa Joe beat Titus O'Neil, Bray Wyatt beat Matt Hardy, Rich Swan beat Noam Dar, Akira Tozawa, and Arya Davari to qualify for the number one contenders match for the Cruiserweight Championship. Intercontinental Champion Roman Reigns beat Elias. Asuka beat Dana Brooke. Kane beat Jason Jordan via countout. And Finn Balor beat Kane via disqualification. On WWE SmackDown Live, The New Day beat Chad Gable and Shelton Benjamin. The Bludgeon Brothers, Harper and Rowan, beat The Hype Bros, Zack Ryder and Mojo Rawley. WWE Champion AJ Styles beat The Singh Brothers, Samir and Sunil Singh, in a handicap match. The Riot Squad, Ruby Riot, Sarah Logan, and Liv Morgan beat SmackDown Women's Champion Charlotte Flair. Natalia and Naomi and Kevin Owens beat Randy Orton in a no disqualification match. On WWE 205 Live, Rich Swan beat Noam Dar, Kalisto beat Jack Gallagher, and Drew Gulak and Tony Nese beat Mustafa Ali and Cedric Alexander. And that's all for this week's Wrestling Results Roundup. Yee-haw! I'm Mike, alongside the founder of ProWrestlingAlmanac.com, Tristan. What's going on, man? <sighs> Not a whole lot. i uh, like to apologize for uh, the show being a day late. I got held up two hours uh, late at work yesterday. It's like, you know, adult stuff. Go figure. Adult stuff sucks. Yeah, I know. And it's like, I'm almost 40. And I'm still like, why do I have to do adult things? I'm not an adult. Oh, wait. <laughs> yeah, I am. But, uh, so, let me ask you a question. Have you seen the uh, Infinity War trailer yet? No, I have not. Dude, you need to see that thing. It's pretty freaking epic. Really? Yes. 
And like, like I, you know, I like I needed to be more excited for the movie, but yeah. And then I see these Marvel things, and it just it just makes me sad because you see all the things that DC is doing wrong. You mean everything? Yeah, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, and then there's talk eventually that uh, you know Disney is working on getting uh, the rights back to X Men and Fantastic Four. Yeah. Well, and they're Fantastic. talking about outright buying like a big chunk of Fox. Yeah, they they would buy uh, a decent. It, it would not involve Fox News and Fox Sports, right? But so it would be everything else. You know, the like the the X Men thing is cool and all of that, but I think the thing I'm most excited about is getting to hear the Fox fanfare in front of Star Wars again. Yeah, because it just belongs there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know that and, well, and the THX those that, were the two things that you know I didn't even think about this but Disney buying Fox or you know the bulk of Fox will give them the rights to the video rights to the original trilogy as well so they can release the unaltered versions of well not the original trilogy A New Hope so they can release the unaltered version on Blu-ray yeah so that that's pretty cool. Let's see what, happens. but yeah. uh, you know, just you know, eventually Disney's going to own the world. That's well, so I nice. I told you about that years ago. That the uh, that, remember the Malibu Mer was a death ray. Oh yeah, definitely. And a giant battle on Tom Sawyer's Island while that, that while Fantasmic is going on. Oh, trust me, I did a few things when Fantasmic was going on. I'm but, sure you, uh, on Tom Sawyer's Island. Oh yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, so so, but, uh, so wrestling. What's wrestling? I don't know. Nah, no, exactly. So, um, man, uh, some pretty interesting stuff going on this week. Uh, yeah, one of the big one of the big ones coming out is that it it has been made official as of yesterday, but Anthem is no longer going to be trademarking any of their characters uh, in Impact Wrestling. Yeah. Um, which, that's, that's, that's huge. Yeah, no, so should I not include them on the roundup from now on since they're just a glorified indie fed now? Uh, I mean, that's... <sighs> Okay, it's gonna it's gonna allow them to get more talent, I think, because they're not gonna come off as WWE ish. But this is not a step in the right direction for them. No, it's not. But you know, it's it's gonna like you said, it's gonna let them get. You know, some some talent in there that probably wouldn't have gone in there. I mean, I know for a lot of wrestlers, constantly having to change your name, depending on the company that you're wrestling for, becomes troublesome. You know, it, it's not something that you want to do. I mean, it's it's very rare. Unless you're John Hennigan. Well, yeah. But, I mean, it's, it's you know, that very rare. That guy changes rare. his name when he changes his socks. <laughs> that's true but uh like i said you know it's rare that you get guys like uh a bobby Roode, an aj styles well that are able it, it to... didn't used to be that rare it's become substantially more common like in, for the wwe um and in this in this era because like triple h pushed for Hideo Itami to come in as Kenta pushed for Kevin Owens to be Kevin Steen and those didn't happen but then yeah. AJ Styles came in and Austin Aries came in and Eric Young came in and they all came in Bobby Roode and they all came in under their uh, previous names that they had been known by and the last person really to do this was CM Punk Mm -hmm. In what, 2005, 2006? Yeah. So, 
and eight. So we're talking to a ten year gap where we had to set where we had to deal with Scotty Goldman and Braden Walker and uh, Marcus Corvang. Yeah, um, you know, I the big thing about this though that I'm loving is that. With that being said, Anthem has said that they are not going to go after the trademark rights to the broken yep. gimmick. Which is is huge for Matt Hardy. Oh, and, and Jeff, if he, if, yes. if he decides to use the Brother Nero. Yes, because, see, now, now, will it mean money and things for WWE? Probably. But yeah. the, the Hardy boys are over. And so the, I, I was really wondering over the last few weeks with Matt Hardy appearing on main event, but also appearing on Raw, pulling double duty um, and losing and losing and losing. And then finally this week, he lost to Bray Wyatt and he snapped and he started and he started broke. yelling out delete. He broke. Yeah. Or, um, well, it's looking more like he woke than he broke. Uh, well, it looks like it's going to be the Woken Hardys as opposed to the Broken Hardys. Which then allows the WWE to trademark at least Woken, you know. And, but, yet, and then Matt Hardy, if should they leave, can still go elsewhere and use it. With the Broken, exactly. Right. And I'm so, sure that's part, part of his idea as well. Um there's a lot of elements of the uh, the Broken Universe that are were were a huge part of why the the gimmick was so successful. Vanguard one, for example. Uh huh. Um, uh, and things like that. Being able to go to other promotions and take the tag belts and go on a mission of collecting all of the tag belts in the world. Yeah. And uh, the, the filming at the uh, the Hardy home in Cameron. Which was which was huge. Yes, you know? um, those are things that because of the way that Impact runs, that they are willing to do that WWE may not be. Um, so it's it's going to be interesting to see how they uh, how they compensate for such things, or if they just let it happen. Because they, 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 they might. They might. I mean, so Matt Hardy uh, tweeted yesterday. He goes, the Great War is merely beginning on this plane identified as WWE. I must recruit loyal soldiers from around the planet of Earth to join me as I battle in a domain overflowing with darkness and demons. Our platoon has much to do. And it's his... His Twitter name, even though it's still at Matt Hardy brand. Yeah, Woken uh, Matt Hardy. Ha yeah, hashtag Woken Matt Hardy. So, I mean, I'm excited to see it. Um, I am you know, too. It, yeah, it'll be, it'll be interesting because let's be honest, it's been a while since we've had a, a really unique out there yeah a breakout not, a breakout gimmick even well exactly not your typical wwe formulaic type gimmick yes you know so you know i'm i'm excited to see it can't wait to see what they do with it um like i said if they bring in brother nero that'll be even better mm -hmm. uh because i think you know the hardys this is just my input on it the hardys we're kind of in a very interesting scenario because, you know, they they weren't really doing anything as of late. I mean, yes, you know, Jeff was out with the injury. Right. But it was more along the lines of the only reason people were even paying attention is because they wanted to see if and when, you know, the broken Matt Hardy would finally get to reappear. Well, the fact because that Matt never changed his hair. Well, that really that led hard. to speculation that it was going to happen. And I think that they were telling him, look, you're going to be able to do it in some fashion. You're going to be able Sooner to do it. Later. You're going to be able to do it. And that's why he, they well, kept. I mean, because you and I had talked about it before. Even if Anthem was going to try to go after the, the trademark to it, there is no way that they would have been able to compete financially with a legal battle from the WWE. True. 
But they could have drawn it out long enough that WWE was no longer interested. Which is possible. So, but, you know, I'm excited. Be, I am too. That's going to be mostly because I'm aware of the gimmick and I saw a lot of things about it, but I wasn't watching TNA then. So I did yeah, not see no, a was, lot of, of that angle. And I was I'm interested to, to see. You know, when I when I wanted to see what was going on with, you know, uh, by the way, if you ever get a chance, um, I don't know if you've been able to do it yet, but go back and look at the Ross report. Yeah. And he did an entire interview with broken Matt Hardy. Oh, wow. No, a lot of the uh, a lot of the uh, older episodes are behind a paywall. Mm, so. OK. Yeah, no, this one, literally, Matt Hardy did the entire interview in character. Nice. And it was it was absolutely amazing. So um, happy for him. Happy yeah. Happy for Jeff. Happy if this works out. But there is some sad news, man. 35-year WWE employee, the, the man who is responsible for pretty much every entrance Every pay-per-view theme. Well, at least old school, until they started using well, bands to record them and everything. But he would still write a lot of the music. Oh, yeah. I mean, but yeah, Jim Johnston has been released. Yeah, so that's like the Fink getting released. It is. You know, he's I been mean, around for so long. My understanding, though, is that he left for a while and then came back. But um, either way, he's it's still... You know his his time has come and gone, really. Like they they use a lot of uh, they use a lot of mainstream music as themes. They get yeah. they get well, mainstream have, bands. Um, uh, who is who is uh, CFO is doing a lot of the um, composing now, which is uh, Mike Laurie and John uh, Ali Castro. Okay. Uh, they're the ones that are they they pretty much were doing a lot of the NXT stuff. Huh. But um, I mean, if you just look at the people, you know, especially for you and me watching wrestling as you know kids in the nineties. I oh, mean, yeah. did the Warrior, Jake the Snake, Roberts, Bret Hart's mm -hmm. song, Goldust, you know, I mean, Vader, Austin, well, yeah. Ray, Razor Ramon, and then remixed it into Steve Austin's. Yeah, the most I could the mean, rock, all the rocks music except for the, the one rock, that Method McMahon, Man or whoever did. Yeah, M McMahon, <clears throat> Angle, Kane, he didn't do Ed. McMahon. No, it's that was weird. the well, he might have written it. It was the the, the Chris Warren band that recorded it. The yeah, same guys that did the DX it. theme song. Um, you know, and Jericho's. So I mean, and then he did do um, Baron Corbin's new entrance theme. He also, uh, my understanding is, is that he did. Uh, Ambrose and Rollins and Rain, maybe Reigns as well. But yeah, I mean, it's it is. It's just, I mean, over thirty plus years with the company, yeah. uh, and and that's it. He's done. So yeah, but I um, mean, he's he's not a young guy anymore. He might be hanging it up. He's been making some good money for some good years. So oh, yeah. you know, I think it might be time to uh, enjoy some of that money. Definitely. So he can enjoy um, some of it to my way. And then uh, also, uh, we mentioned it, and, and until I told you about it, you weren't aware of it, but man, what the hell is going on with Sexy Star? I don't know, and this isn't getting a lot of, a lot of play because it's only at that one place because I looked it up, and every other site that had a story about Sexy Star had it had the August one. But this is a completely different thing, and this is her getting kicked in the face hard. And oh, then, yeah, yeah. And no, then, going, I mean, I... then going berserker mode on this chick, and it's... Oh, excuse me. It's not pretty. No, it's it's not. I mean, she. I mean, I understand. You're 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 sitting in the corner, and when when you're giving your body to someone, you expect them to try to take care of you. But I mean, stiff shots happen all the time. Though, it, it man, does, it is but, a physical sport. Yeah, but she got stiff. Yeah, so she got I mean, blasted though. Oh, oh yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah. No, no, she did. But I mean, you're you're starting to see. A pattern that she 
does not take too well to, to, you know, getting a little strong style thrown her way. Well, you got to think that th- this this could be it. Like this is the second time in what is many since since the summer since Triple Mania. So really, not since that long, and it is just it's it's a trend. Yeah. And um, that's not a good not a good trend. Yeah, if you guys want to see the video, because like Tristan said, we we have not seen it um, anywhere else. We'll post the link on uh, the Facebook page for the Pro Wrestling Almanac Oh yeah, thanks. Um, Volunteer me for things. I, I, I'll post it. On Fine, there. you care. you post it. You All right. do it. I do. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, it, it's definitely uh, disturbing to watch her. Uh, just, I mean, literally, you just saw her throw a, a hard kicker and knee to the right temple of her opponent. Yeah. And it, it's just, once again, it's, it's, I don't know why it's not getting the play that the uh, original one against Rosemary. Uh, did but we'll find out. I mean, it was it was a few days ago, so um, and I think maybe because of the fact that it was at a smaller uh, event, it it wasn't something as big as you know Triple A's event. That maybe that's why. Yeah, maybe so. Uh, we're not seeing it. So, uh, and then finally, WWE Studios uh, is going to be expanding into TV and digital content production. Um, this is going to get interesting. Uh, it sounds like they are going to be getting into scripted, non scripted, family, and animated television that is not WWE related. Yeah, um, this has been something that's been speculated on for quite a while since they started the WWE Network. And um, looks like they're finally uh, they're finally going to go pull the trigger on it. And um, I can only hope that in doing this, they decide to renew the Edge and Christian show that totally reeks of awesomeness. Because... It totally reeks of awesomeness. <laughs> Have you yeah, watched I, it yet? I told you to watch it. Have you watched it? Uh, no, I, oh, I haven't. We're not friends anymore. Okay, that's fine. I, I'll we get can, my we Wednesday. Can, we can Thursday still do the uh, we can still do the podcast together, though, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I see how it is now. Yeah. Oh, please. But uh, this yeah, is, this no. is the the most the most you can get people to listen to you talk, anyway. No, 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 no. There's there's other places I can go. Oh, okay. But uh I'm going to go to sleep. <laughs> so, uh by the way guys, I did I just posted that right now on the uh Pro Wrestling Almanac Facebook page if you guys want to take a look. Um but yeah, no. So I hope eventually we can get to the point where WWE is going to be able to broadcast both Raw and SmackDown on the network. I would like that. I really would. Um, as long yeah. as, as like we were talking about before, as long as they still have a network home, because they're going to alienate a lot of people, piss a lot of people off. When when UFC Fight Pass launched and WWE Network launched, I was explaining to one of my friends who's not a wrestling fan, who is a fight fan, why the WWE Network was better than UFC Fight Pass. And one, it was $3 cheaper. Yes. Uh, UFC Fight Pass was twelve ninety five. WWE Network nine ninety nine. Okay. The UFC Fight Pass. The thing about the UFC Fight Pass is what they did is they started airing Fight Pass exclusive shows in the U.S. when they would typically have aired those shows live, respective to the time zone that they were done in. On so, Fox Sports, yeah, or where at, or Fuel or wherever they aired their shows. So the uh, where so so the UFC was now charging. going to charge you for things they were that you were that they were giving away for free, 
And so there, but the, and the only incentive was that there was a, they had all their past events on the fight pass. The WWE network, on the other hand, was now offering in the price of their membership, what they used to charge $60 for. Oh, so yeah. literally, I mean. literally for the cost of two pay-per-views or not even two, if one of those is WrestleMania, you're now getting all of them plus all of the historical shows on demand whenever you want them. Yeah. So the WWE Network was a was a vastly better uh, deal. If WWE decides to put Raw and SmackDown on the network exclusively, that is a mistake. Yeah, uh, I agree with you on that one. Um, I definitely think they need to find a way to cut a deal uh, and simulcast. Uh, to yeah. be able to, or, or you know what, I would even be, I would even be fine with them broadcasting Ron SmackDown on the network the next day. You know, and there has been, uh, there was a poll out asking how many people would be interested in that for like a three dollar more subscription. Yeah, which I I personally wouldn't mind because no, I don't have cable. Yeah, you know? and I yeah exactly. I mean, I I end up having to watch, you know, Ron SmackDown in, you know, thirty five minute increments for uh, Monday Night Raw in a breakdown, and you know, a twenty five to twenty eight minute breakdown of SmackDown, you know, the next day on YouTube. Yeah. So, um, I'm all for it. You know, I'm all for it. I hope it's something that they eventually do. Uh, one thing I am looking forward to uh, that is in the works. It should be coming out. Um, let me see here. It should be actually coming out pretty soon. Uh, I think it's at the beginning of the year. But WWE is partnered with HBO huh. um, for a special on Andre the Giant. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. I have heard it's, about this. It's a documentary uh, on Andre. And where is it? Um, That's not important. We can find it at another time. Yeah. But, but yeah, that, I have definitely heard about this. Like a feature length documentary. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's it's not a, you know, we're talking about something that is going to be along the same lines lengthwise as the 30, you know, for, the 30. 30 for 30. Well, also because um, Bill Simmons is the one who's responsible for this and he was the one that created and developed the whole 30 for 30 concept for ESPN okay. back in 2007 2008 so um, that'll be interesting but uh, that's it right now what we got for uh, for the news segment um, let's see here. you got questions for me yeah, give me one Ooh. second. My Yay. internet page just crashed. Uh, what a you loser. You gotta love when that stuff happens. <laughs> what a loser. <laughs> uh, uh, I could sing for the for the people. Do do no. do 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 Why does it sound like you were doing the Rocky and Bullwinkle song? I, I actually don't know the Rocky and Bullwinkle song. How do you not? Because I didn't know there was a song. Uh, uh. I was like, hey, Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. <laughs> Wrong hat! All right, let's see if I can get this back up. <laughs> <laughs> That's what she said. <laughs> yeah, go figure. <laughs> This is the part of the show where we turn into children. Yep. Because it's an hour later than we typically start, and a day later, and ooh, I, I, I don't know what I'm. I'm tired. I'm actually like working and stuff now. Like I'm actually like really working, really doing things. Fortunately, I still love my job. Okay. Hey, and back to our show. Okay. Um, I'm still not editing this out, you know. That's fine. Okay. We're gonna we're gonna go with some WWE title history questions. <laughs> um, 
these will be pretty simple for you possibly well that's um, like you know that that's like my strongest area <laughs> is title histories just just a tad just I mean, a tad you know like uh which wrestler has held the wwf championship for the longest period of time gee i don't know is it bruno san martino from what years 63 to 71 and then 73 to 77 God, I still don't know how. I mean, if I asked you, you could name every champion from the first one to now, probably. I still could, yes. That's that. That just hurts. Uh, I can't do Intercontinental you? anymore, though. Oh yeah, no that that has gotten that has gotten crazy. Yeah. Um, I remember at one point you were actually able to do the hardcore, which was, I was. really impressive. I was, yes. That that was really impressive, but. Uh, all right, next question. Uh, which wrestler was the reigning WWF champion at WrestleMania 8? Ric Flair. Correct. Uh, how many times has Edge won the Intercontinental Championship? Oh, shoot. Okay. He beat Jeff Jarrett. One. He beat Lance Storm. Two. He beat Christian. Three. He beat Test. Four. He beat Randy Orton five five. Uh, my my says four. It does not have Orton on there. So he beat Randy Orton in two thousand four, right before Randy Orton won the world title. He beat him at Vengeance two thousand four. Okay. Well, I will I will go with you on that one. I mean, you 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 nailed the other ones. Yeah. Uh, in order to. Mm-hmm. Um, so. it's the only way, that's the only way I would have been able to figure it out. Oh, yeah. Uh, next one. Who did Crash Holly defeat for his first hardcore championship? Test. Correct. Uh, and what did he do after defeating Test? He said he was going to defend it 24-7. Correct. Uh, what was the first title that Christian ever won? The light heavyweight title. And who did he beat? Taka. Correct. Uh, this will be the very last one. Uh, how many WWF championship match- matches were featured at WrestleMania's 9 and 10 combined? Four. The fact that you didn't even have to think. Um, you know what? Here, I'm going to go with one more because that, that, I mean, that was disgusting that you were able to go that way. <laughs> um, Rick Martell held the tag team championship on several occasions with varying partners. Yeah. Who was his last partner? Tito Santana. Okay, you know what? We're done. All right. <laughs> <laughs> he held it with Tony Gurria twice as well. Oh, gee. Okay, you know what? That's it. I think I'm going to discontinue this because it's just getting ridiculous. Well, it's um, really not. I like, know. The titles, it, your, the, the titles is, is my subject, man, because it's 1,000% statistics. You yes. know, it's just – it's why I used to be able to memorize my baseball cards when I was a kid because oh, yeah. it's just it's, – it's just statistics. And that's where my strong point is. I've told you if you want to stump me, the questions you need to ask are matches – about at specific events and like even pay-per-views be honest be when you when you get into like the mid to late 2000s they're going to be fuzzy for me because i stopped watching for a while that is true so if that if you want to stump me those are the those are the areas if you if you want if you don't want to stump me yeah stick to title questions i'm good at those yeah, it's it, it's ridiculous how good you are. So, uh, well, that's it for both this week's uh, in wrestling news and the Stump the Almanac portion, folks. Go ahead, check out our site at prowrestlingalmanac.com. Uh, follow us on Twitter and Instagram at PW Almanac and on Facebook. Uh, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and on iTunes, and we can be heard on TuneIn Radio and Google Play. And you can subscribe there as well. Now, I'm gonna I'm gonna pander for just a little bit here. It's- if you've subscribed to us on iTunes, tune in, Google Play, go to our YouTube channel and give us a subscribe, please. We're going to try to start adding more content to that that's video based. Uh, we may do like top five lists, top ten lists. We're going to start adding the uh, events calendar, which will be a weekly thing. 
and I'm going to try to do that up really good. Um, and you know, the more vid- the more content we get on there. Uh, the more people will see it, but the more subscribers we have, the more people will see it as well. So uh, if you guys could do us that kindness, that would be wonderful. Pandering over. Yeah. um, You know, definitely we want to do some more stuff with it like we did with the uh, pay-per-view breakdown. Um, yep. Which which was definitely enjoyable. And so. seemed to be it still seems to be doing pretty well. We got well, we've got we've got more people listening to that it seems like than we did our weekly our weekly show. Hmm. So um, yeah, so that's good. No, oh, definitely, definitely. So all right, well now we're going to take a look back into wrestling history, folks, as we are visited by the ghost of wrestling's past. You, the spirit whose coming was foretold? I am. Who? What are you? I am the ghost. Wrestling's past. Okay, so for this week's wrestling past, Ghosts of Wrestling's Past, I chose the Raw from September 20th, 1997. Now... I realized after the fact, after Mike pointed out to me, well, there was no Raw on September 20th, 1997. Yeah, because that would have been Saturday. Yeah, what was on September 20th, 1997 was one night only. So what I meant was the Raw from September 22nd, 1997. Yeah. And uh, this was a big Raw. This was, was probably the biggest Raw to that date. Oh, excuse me. We... Uh, we are at the tail end of Austin's Stunner Rampage. In successive weeks, at Ground Zero, he stunned Jim Ross. Then on Raw, the following night, on the 8th, he stunned Sergeant Slaughter when Slaughter stripped him of the Intercontinental title. Then the following week, Austin got served with a restraining order by Owen Hart, and Jerry Lawler kept reading it over his shoulder, so Austin just reached back and stunned him, and then punted his crowd into the cr- his crown into the crowd. That was great. And then on this night was the big one. This was the one that kicked off the Attitude Era, really, that kicked off the Austin McMahon feud. He came out to the ring. He attacked Owen Hart. The police came into the ring. He attacked a police officer. They were going to arrest him. Vince intervened, tried to plead his case to Steve Austin. Seemed like he was getting somewhere, and Austin uttered the infamous phrase, I appreciate the fact that you and the fans of the World Wrestling Federation care. And I also appreciate the fact that, hell, you can kiss my ass. And he stunned Vince McMahon. And this was only like, what, like five minutes of the show? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, let's let's well, let's start at the beginning. I mean, because this was when you look at the card for this Monday Night Raw, I mean, being like you said, the first Raw at Madison Square Garden. Um you know, I mean, the 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 evening started off with Ahmed Johnson uh, defeating Rocky Maivia in the Intercontinental Title uh, Tournament, right. which was a quarterfinal match. And let's uh, not discount the fact that Rocky Maivia was in the nation. Yes, in Ahmed Johnson's spot. Uh huh. So, you know, Ahmed uh, was always feuding with the nation, but there was a built-in feud there with Rocky Maivia as well. Oh yeah. Uh, next match, you had the LOD uh, going up against the Nation, which who at the time for this match fighting was going to be Farouk and Kama Mustafa. Um, the Supreme Fighting Godfather. <laughs> uh, um, well, he wasn't a witch doctor anymore. Well, that is true. He or was pimp. pre. He was pre pimp. This is, this is when he was like Nation of Islam, comma. Yes, exactly. So uh, m- next match after that, which was probably one of my favorite matches uh, of the evening. <laughs> yeah, this match is so good. 
<laughs> uh, Owen Hart uh, going up against Brian Pillman. Oh man, it was oh, it was so fantastic. The way that they put that that match had so much storyline packed into it. Because yeah. first you have the you've got the Goldust Marlena Pillman angle, mm-hmm. which is very difficult to watch nowadays because of everything, especially with everything that's going on within Hollywood and like you well, were wondering if this was going to happen in wrestling. Um, that was just a straight up abduction and rape angle. Basically. <laughs> and my understanding is from where they were going to go with it is that basically when Goldust and Marlena were going to renew their vows, she was just going to confess her love for Pillman. So it was going to be a kidnapping, rape, Stockholm Syndrome angle. Yeah. And so, which which would not fly today because people are just so damn sensitive. Let's, let's, let's just rewind a little bit here. USA Network was flooded with complaints and they had to address it on live wire and all of that stuff when uh, when Pillman pulled a gun and they cut may the have may have shot at Steve Austin may not have it literally took attempted murder for them to complain for people yeah. to complain and nowadays you had a parent Complaining and trying to sue WWE because Alberto Del Rio, a bad guy, took the sign away from her son and ripped it up. No, that was Kevin Owens. No, it was Alberto Del Rio. Well, Owens had another one, too, where the the mom went on and tried to start this huge social media campaign because Owens was yelling at the kid, you know, because he had a KO shirt on, but then was cheering for Owens' uh, opponent. And, you know, it's it's on video. I mean, they have it recorded where Owens like, I don't even want you as a fan anymore, you know? Yeah. Um, Oh, I know. I saw that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's. You know, I, I wish we could go back to a time period where no one was easily offended and we could just make fun of everybody, but... Yeah, that'd be nice. You know, it's unfortunately, it's the, it's the millennials' fault. Well, no, see, but the, the problem is is that it's people getting offended on behalf of other people. Well, that too. So, anyway, let's, let's not talk about that. <laughs> let's talk about that match. The fact that, you know, Pillman was trying to feign a broken arm and then they oh, did the bad, the worst fake out in history. Oh, yeah. Throwing the microphone to his left and him catching it. Yep. And then um, uh, and then the slow motion match between Pillman and Owen. The, the breaks always kill me. Uh-huh. They get into the corner. Both of them just put their hands in the air. I love it. I love it. Oh, yeah. It was it was fantastic. And then Marlena starts causing trouble, and then it turns into a real match. Uh-huh. Then Goldust interferes, attacking Owen first to cost Pillman the match, and then goes after Pillman. Pillman doesn't try to fight back. He rolls out of the ring, grabs Marlena, runs away. Mm-hmm. And then Owen takes credit for a hard-fought victory and thank, pledges the victory to his brother and then gets attacked by Austin to where we got into when we started. Yep. Then the next match was the next match, the Triple H Dude Love street fight. Yes, it was. This is another one of the most famous Moments in the in the Attitude Era, pre Attitude Era, the three faces of Foley. Yes. So, I mean, Foley's from Long Island, so this is a bit of a homecoming for him. He was Cactus Jack for all of his career until what about a year and a half before this. Mm-hmm. And you never thought you'd see Cactus Jack in the WWF. Yeah, no, I mean, you 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 had him start off with the mankind, and then, you know, they they brought in that split personality with the dude love character, uh, but 
everybody wanted to see Cactus Jack. Well, and you know, and this culminated at the Royal Rumble in 98 when Mick Foley was in three times. Which I I still love yeah. the fact that that happened. Absolutely. I mean, they could totally do it again if it was Mick Foley. Oh, of course. You know, so uh, but you know, the one thing is Going back and looking at that match between Cactus Jack and Triple H, some of Triple H's best matches have come against McFoley. Yes. And do you see what I was telling you about his his reaction? How easily would it have been for him to no-sell Cactus Jack because it's just McFoley? Exactly. But, but he sold because, Cactus Jack like it was the second coming of Jack the Ripper, man. Exactly. Because he, you know, he played off the fact that Cactus Jack was a maniacal, hell-bent on killing himself and his opponent kind of a wrestler. And, and we're talking about a guy that was more sadistic and more suicidal than mankind. Exactly. Who pulled out his own hair. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but yeah, no, I loved, I loved Triple H's reaction. And, you know, this was the longest match of the evening. Yep. Uh, came in at 13 minutes and 40 seconds. Um, um, how about that bump that China took between Mick Foley and the stairs? Oh. That was nasty, know, right? Yeah. I mean, she... She's a trooper, man. She, well, she's a trooper. She doesn't get the credit that she really deserves for what she did. Um, Neither does Mick Foley. Mick Foley was the first person to really bump for her. Mm-hmm. And he made her look like a credible threat and once people saw Mick Foley doing it, more people were willing to do it. Uh-huh. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it was... I, I remember watching that, you know, a couple days ago, and I was just like, good Lord. Um, yep. You know, that that was a hell of a spot. Well, uh, and the the rest of the show was kind of... I mean, the, the Bret Hart-Goldust match, of course it was a great match, because it, uh-huh. was, it was Bret Hart, and, and Dustin Reynolds is an amazing talent in his own right. Um, and so, Which, of course, it was a great match, but there was a lot of story aside from the matches. You had this the build up to Hell in a Cell, and Shawn Michaels had some great lines. I'll bring the pain, dead man. All you's got to do is show up. Yeah. You know, he, uh, why don't you just give The Undertaker a championship match? Michael sold this like he knew going in that he was not going to win. He did not have a chance of winning. Oh, yeah. And, but he was still going to do it. So, I loved Um, that. And then, of course, you had Austin McMahon. Oh, yeah. And... You know, it is it, it's it's funny because I was I was listening today when I was driving home, um, you know, about what was it about five weeks ago? You and I did the Canadian break- Stampede. Yeah, the Canadian Stampede. Something like that. Yeah. Sure enough, I'm I'm you know flipping through my my podcasts, and there is Steve Austin and Court Bauer doing a breakdown of that pay-per-view and it's it's stone cold's first-hand account of everything that was going on and you know the one thing that that's very evident in this episode of raw it can be traced back to that episode or sorry that pay-per-view for canadian stampede um when he was handcuffed uh-huh. at the Canadian Stampede, he was like, well, I, I I wanted to do something that was going to be memorable. And that is when he finally started looking at the crowd. And when he was being led away, he started flipping people off with his hands handcuffed behind his back. Yep. And that was the first time he ever did it. 
um, was at Canadian Stampede. And once again, here it is. He's handcuffed, you know, and he's flipping people off again, you know, as he's being let out. Um, you know, like you said, this this time period for 97, 98 are probably the greatest years oh, for wrestling. I'm sorry, 98, as good as it was, doesn't hold a candle to 97. No, no, I agree. In my opinion, 97 is the best year in wrestling, period. Yeah. I don't think anything else comes close. And the thing is, is like the WWE, had WWF had such great stuff, and yeah. no one was watching. I know. And ECW had great stuff. And less than no one was watching. And everybody was everybody's eyes were on WCW because it is almost impossible to get people to change their viewing habits once they've settled in. So people would watch Nitro on Mondays, even though WWF had the better show. Now, I would say that that is a true statement from about May or June on. They had highlights throughout the first half of the year but once you once Austin and Michaels teamed up to take the tag titles from Owen and the Bulldog that year just screamed forward they had good stuff with the Hart Foundation building up to that but I think that that was the moment that they really got into gear and because right after that, that's when you started having the uh, the Mankind videos and or about that same time and the introduction to do love. And then, you know, Austin got hurt and arguably became more popular, injured. Yeah. Um, not became more popular, not wrestling than he ever did wrestling. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, I still maintain that. No, that Bret Hart did more for Steve Austin's career than anyone else in the WWF, including Steve Austin. Yeah. But the the fact that when he was he was injured and they didn't take him off TV, they kept him on TV. They worked the injury into his storylines, and it made he went from being a megastar to I don't even know what a freaking supernova. He, there was nobody bigger ever than Austin was at in at, from ninety seven from from ninety seven maybe like when he won the Intercontinental title uh, at SummerSlam, SummerSlam until ninety nine when he won the title back from The Rock, mm-hmm. the peak of his popularity. Because I remember, man. Monday Night Raw, January 4th, 1999, when Mick Foley won his first world title. And DX is in his corner, and the corporation is in The Rock's corner, and Ken Shamrock gets into the ring, and then Billy Gunn gets in and cuts off Shamrock, and everybody's fighting. The crowd is, is as loud as I have ever heard them. And then the glass breaks, and they get ten times louder. Oh, yeah. I, I, I truly believe we will never see a wrestler hit that peak. I think we did. Austin. I think we did. Who? Daniel Bryan. No. I, I still... I think... No, you know what? I, I think the Yes movement was big, but it just... And the fans... I, I, I truly think with Daniel Bryan, it was more along the lines of... You know, it started off with the IWC being behind him yeah. because of his independence. Right. I still don't think it was his biggest. Oh no, I I completely disagree, man. Go back and look at SummerSlam 2013 when he won the title from John Cena, mm-hmm. and watch that crowd. And it is one of the most amazing things ever. No, Daniel I, I, Bryan. I Daniel Bryan. I think he may not have been as over as Steve Austin, but he is the closest thing since. Yes. No, I will give you that. And it was but completely I, organic. The fans yes. decided this is the guy that we want to be the guy. 
and they demanded it until they got it. Well, well, there there are similarities because even though Vince wasn't with Daniel an on you know air presence really at the time, the authority you was. still you still have that authority figure. And so, you know, whereas with Austin, you know, everybody loved Austin because Austin just didn't care. Austin was the rattlesnake. Right. He was, he was, he was literally living the dream that everybody who worked for someone, you know, dream being able to flip off your boss, kick him, hit him, do whatever the hell you want. With, 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 With little to no repercussions. Oh, yeah. No, definitely. I think the thing with Daniel Bryan is if Daniel Bryan would not have, if he had not been injured when he did. Oh, yeah. Then we could have seen him surpass Austin in being over. But that whole him having to take almost a year off Mm -hmm. and coming back. And then taking like another year off, yeah. That 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 you know. So I mean, yes, he is the closest that we've ever come. But I mean, look how long that had been. Oh yeah. And I mean, the thing is, is like Austin was the man for what three, four years. Mm-hmm. That's kind of crazy. Yeah. When you think about it. Well, what's what's really crazy is if it wasn't for the fact that Owen dropped Austin on his dome at SummerSlam. He could still be going today. He he could be. Whether or not he would want to is one thing, but, you know, he definitely would not have hung it up after WrestleMania against that match with... uh, The Rock. With The Rock. Only match where The Rock beat Austin, too. Yep. So, and and I still love the fact that, you know, other than a handful of people, no one knew going into that match that that was going to be it for for Austin. Yeah. You know, I don't know. Well, I mean, now, the question is, is Austin even knew? Because if you read his book, he talks about, uh, he talks about going to the hospital that day. Because he was dehydrated and he was overloaded on caffeine and and dehydrated and he didn't even know if he was going to be able to compete. Um, and you got to wonder if that was part of his that that weighed into his decision. You know, probably. I mean, he's talked about it a lot on his podcast um, because you know there's always people who send an email saying, "Hey, you know, do you have one more? Do you have one more match in you?" and you know, I mean, he, he gives a brutal, honest response, which is no. He goes, I don't, and I don't want to. He goes, he went I'm done. Perfectly. You know, yeah, I- exactly. I mean, you know, and he said, yeah, if, if I hadn't been dropped on my head, I would have loved to have gone on for another five, six, seven years. But you know, he goes, I have I have no regrets. Um, he had two blown out knees at that you know, point. I mean, like, uh-huh. he, he was a busted old man. Yep. Well, and I mean, that, that whole, that injury changed him from being a technical wrestler to becoming the brawler that he became. Right. Which, you know, it's, it's that catch-22. It shortened his career... But because it forced him to change his style, that style change is what put him even more over with the fans. And created the WWE main event style that we hate oh so much today. Let's 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 not let's not ignore the fact that Steve Austin pretty much ruined wrestling. (laughs) Um, You have the, the punch kick main event style in WWF. Mm-hmm. You got the what chant. Like, it would be very hard to thank Steve Austin for what he did for wrestling without saying, but you do realize that you also ruined it. So basically, you know, like Vince Russo. Yeah, exactly like Vince Russo. 
His the only difference is everybody be... loves Steve Austin. Yeah. Vince Russo so. takes way too much credit for the good things and tries to skirt the bad things. Uh-huh. You know, Austin is very well aware of the fact that the what chant got out of control. Oh, it, it did. It 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 did. It was funny when it was going on, but it's it's you know, now it's just become a people do it because it's what people do. I, I mean, I will tell you that Steve Austin during that era though is responsible for what I feel is the greatest promo of all time, which is the Beverly Hillbillies. Oh yeah, that is my absolute favorite. Do we watch that together live? Oh yeah, St- sitting at my grandma's house. I I have not laughed so hard. He proceeds to do the entire. He says, "I'm going to tell you a story. It's not a story about a man named Jed." And proceeds to say the entire intro to the Beverly Hillbillies, and then says, "I ain't going to tell you that story." And the crowd explodes. Like that is that is the level of over Steve Austin was. Oh no 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 definitely I I, I completely agree. So uh, you know getting back to what we were talking about ninety seven greatest year for wrestling ever period and period and you know that leads me to I want to do something different okay for for next week. All right. I don't want to read. Does that mean we need to bring? Does that mean we need? Does that mean we need to bring Chad back? <laughs> no, 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 no. no. Um, I wonder know. if he still listens to this and gets insulted when we make fun of him. Uh, I don't know, but um, maybe that's why yeah. he hasn't called me in a month. Possibly, <laughs> um, but yeah, no. I I don't want to review a match. I don't want to review an episode of Raw or SmackDown, and I okay. don't want to do a pay-per-view. All right. I want to do a review on a documentary. Okay, which one? I want to do uh, Hitman and Wrestling with Shadows. Well, you're not going to have to fight too hard to get me to watch that. That's for sure. I know, but you know... I've probably seen it like 50 times. Like, no no joke. I've watched it so many times. I just watched it a couple days ago. Um, And I'll watch it again, you know, probably this week again. But, you know, the reason I want to do this is, I mean, you know I love history. I love documentaries. I mean... Just in general, not... Yeah. Any, anything, any specific genre. No, no. Like, I mean, I have no problem sitting on the couch and watching Ken Burns' Civil War, and yeah, I but absolutely any, love it. But who would? Who wouldn't? Who um, would have a problem with that? I know a lot of people. Well, they're, ter- they're horrible people. Well, and that's why I don't talk to them anymore. Yeah. But, um, you know, when you, when you look at documentaries, it's very rare that you get a documentary that is... Most of them are retrospective documentaries. Um, for me, probably two of my favorite documentaries of all time have to be Wrestling with Shadows, mm-hmm. and there is another one called Senna. Okay. And Senna is about a uh, three time Formula One champion, Ayrton Senna. Okay. And what makes that one so intriguing is that it is following Senna in what ends up being the last couple years of his life because uh, he wins his third championship and they're doing interviews with him the morning he dies Mm. at a race in Italy. And, you know, you're watching this all unfold as it's happening, not looking back on it. And, And the thing is, it's very rare in a sport like wrestling which for decades was a heavily guarded industry and when still it, is to degree to, well, to it, it, and it is but i mean you know we're talking about a time period where you had promoters that find wrestlers 
if they were caught, you know, hanging out with uh, a, a baby face, if they were a heel, and by you know, you have yeah. the heel. Well, shoot, um, Jim Duggan and the Iron Sheep got fired because they got pulled over and were caught with drugs and they were fired, not because they got caught with drugs. But because they were caught in the same car together and they yep. were feuding at the time. Yep. Um, you know, and so the fact that, you know, we're talking about 97 and this documentary covers roughly um, Canadian Stampede up until the Montreal Screwjob. Yeah, and the fact is that, like you were talking about, that Senna guy, I've never heard of him before, but I'm not a, I'm not a race fan, and you know that. Yeah. Um, the fact that because they were doing this, this living documentary... Exactly. They managed to capture his death as it happened. Uh huh. The same thing happened with Bret Hart in Wrestling with Shadows. We we watched the death of his career. Yeah, I mean, really, we did. I mean, and he and he predicted. I mean, he literally predicted what was and, and, WC, I, WCW is not going to. I don't think WC. I don't want to go to WCW. They're not going to know what to do with me. Vince well, said he, WCW is not going to know what to do with you. Well, but remember, he even said, though, that, you know, when it came to the WWE, he goes, they're basically going to go out there and rape me. Oh, yeah. Well, you no, know? he said if if they take the title from me, yes. it would be like they went out in, in Canada. It would be like going out into the middle of the ring and raping me. Raping me. Yes. He didn't, so- he, he didn't say that they were going to do that to his career. What he did say was that Shawn Michaels and Triple H who, to their credit, were told by Vince, you don't know anything about this. Uh Uh-huh. They played dumb, and Brett said, well, we'll see how you handle this on Raw. And a couple of weeks later, sure enough, they had midget midget Brett. Oh, yeah. So, So, well, we'll go over, like I said, but yeah, the... It, I want to go back and I want to look at key things that were said by by Brett, by Vince, and, and and look to see how that's affected even things today <laughs> with with what is going on. So it's it's been twenty years. You know, November 9th, uh, twenty seventeen was the twentieth anniversary of the Montreal Screw Job. Wow, that hurts. I, I what was that? That hurts. I oh trust me. I was I a senior in high school when that uh, um, happened. You know, but I uh, you know, and I didn't want to do the typical let's go review the Montreal screw job, you know, in its entirety. Right. But you know, this is something that we don't get to see the background stuff in wrestling a lot. I mean more so now we are with shows like you know, Total Divas, as much as you can take that for what it is. I've never watched one episode of that, and I'm you proud are. to say that I have not. Unfortunately, I have had to because Taylor wants to watch it sometimes. Um, oh, boy. Yeah, I know. Go figure. Yeah, I, I mean, but I despite all of her, uh, all of her uh, athleticism and everything, she is still a girl. I can say, though, I have not watched a single episode of Total, Be- Total Bellas, though. Mm. So That's the one that's got John Cena and Daniel Bryan on it, mostly. So Yes, but I just, I don't know. I'm not a big fan of the Bellas, and they drive me nuts. Well, speaking um, of Total Divas, though, my friend Alex Light, a uh, wrestler, he's down in Tampa. He's good friends with TJ Wilson. Okay. And he, uh, who, if you don't know, is Tyson Kidd. Tyson Kidd. And uh, didn't say that for your benefit. Um, and uh, uh, he was just showing footage of him and Tyson Kidd and this other guy playing a basketball game at a at a bar, and it was just kind of funny because it was like the side of people you never get to see. Oh yeah. So, but yeah, that that's the biggest reason why I wanted to do this because you know we get we get that background look, we get to see what was going on in the mind of Brett, um, you know, and how just so many things uh changed with with just that short because we're talking what canadian stampede was on july, july 6th. 6th yes yeah, july, july 6th. 6th and the screw job was november 9th four I mean, months 
It, well, and, and during that four month period, we we lost Brian Pillman. Brett became champion. Brett became champion. Austin gets injured by by you know um, Owen. Owen, which I find that kind of ironic that that never even got remotely mentioned. Even though I know it's a documentary on Brett, and that's but, why. Yeah, but we never saw anything from SummerSlam in that documentary. No, nope, because it became a documentary about the screw job. Yeah. It, it, exactly. So, um, but yeah. So we'll. That's what we'll be doing next week. Um, Exciting. Kind of, kind of change, change it up a little bit. Yeah. So. That should All be right. Fun. So, um, what do we got next? Indie spotlight. Indie spotlight. Indie wrestling. Indie wrestling. Indie wrestling. Indie wrestling. Indie wrestling. Indie wrestling. Indie wrestling, indie wrestling, indie wrestling, indie wrestling, indie wrestling, indie wrestling, indie wrestling. Today's Indie Spotlight features a West Coast Wrestling Connection based in Salem, Oregon. They ran their first show on March 20th, 2005, and today can be seen every Saturday night at 11 p.m. on KPDX-TV in Portland, Oregon. Some of their talent includes Pacific Heavyweight Champion Jeff Boom, Legacy Champion Rock God Ricky Gibson, Oregon Champion Ethan HD, Tag Team Champions The Bonus Boys, and Oregon Tag Team Champions The Magnificent Bastards. In an interesting move, the Oregon Championship and the Oregon Tag Team Championship are only defended at live events, giving extra incentive to attend their shows live. The promotion also has a training school, the WCWC Training Academy, which operates under the direction of lead trainer Eric Baden. If you're interested in seeing WCWC live, they are presenting the Hunger Slam, a wrestling marathon to raise money for the Marion Polk Food Share Program. This event starts on Saturday, December 2nd at noon and will end on the afternoon of December 3rd. It takes place at the Scottish Rite Center at 4090 Commercial Street Southeast in Salem, Oregon. And admission is $10 for the entire show, so you can come and go as you please. Also, if you come with a donation of three or more cans of food, you will save $2 on admission. The event will also have a snack bar and free coffee, and tickets will only be available at the door. So check out West Coast Wrestling Connection every Saturday night at 11 p.m. on KPDX TV in Portland, Oregon. Also online, you can follow them on Facebook and Twitter at the WCWC or on their website at wc-wc.com. And that's it for this week's Indie Spotlight. Check out these events for exciting professional wrestling action. Wednesday, November 29th, NXT is live at Full Sail University in Winter Park, Florida. Thursday, November 30th, New Japan Pro Wrestling presents World Tag League 2017 Night 10 at Korokuen Hall in Tokyo, Japan. Thursday, November 30th, NXT is live at the Lakeland Armory in Lakeland, Florida. Thursday, November 30th, NXT is live at the Stage AE in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Thursday, November 30th, WWE is live at the Jockey Club Del Peru in Lima, Peru. Friday, December 1st, New Japan Pro Wrestling presents World Tag League 2017 Night 11 at Toyohashi City General Gymnasium in Aichi, Japan. Friday, December 1st, NXT is live at the Mark Lance Armory in St. Augustine, Florida. Friday, December 1st, NXT is live at the Jaffa Shrine Center in Altoona, Pennsylvania. Friday, December 1st, WWE is live at the Arena Ciudad de Mexico in Mexico City, Mexico. Saturday, December 2nd, New Japan Pro Wrestling presents World Tag League 2017 Night 12 at Osaka Municipal Central Gymnasium in Osaka, Japan. Saturday, December 2nd, New Era Wrestling presents Seasons Beatings at Mile High Comics in Denver, Colorado. Saturday, December 2nd, NXT is live at the St. Petersburg Armory in St. Petersburg, Florida. Saturday, December 2nd, NXT is live at the APG Federal Credit Union Arena in Baltimore, Maryland. Saturday, December 2nd, Revolution Pro Wrestling presents Contenders at the Buckland Community Center in Portsmouth, England. 
Saturday, December 2nd, Rise Wrestling presents Rise of the Champion at the Stronghold in Lamont Furnace, Pennsylvania. Saturday, December 2nd, West Coast Wrestling Connection presents The Hunger Slam, a wrestling marathon from the 2nd to the 3rd at the Scottish Rite Center in Salem, Oregon. Saturday, December 2nd, WWE is live at Coliseo Yucatan in Yucatan, Mexico. Saturday, December 2nd, WWE Live Holiday Tour is at the Maverick Center in Salt Lake City, Utah. Sunday, December 3rd, New Japan Pro Wrestling presents World Tag League 2017 Night 13 at the Kochi Prefectural Gymnasium in Kochi, Japan. Sunday, December 3rd, Primo's Professional Wrestling presents Infamous at the Watering Bowl in Denver, Colorado. Sunday, December 3rd, Revolution Pro Wrestling presents Live at the Cockpit 23 at the London Cockpit in London, England. Sunday, December 3rd, WWE is live at Marina Monterey in Monterey, Mexico. Sunday, December 3rd, WWE Live Holiday Tour is at the Honda Center in Anaheim, California. Monday, December 4th, WWE Raw is at the Staples Center in Los Angeles, California. Tuesday, December 5th, New Japan Pro Wrestling presents World Tag League 2017 Night 14 at Oida Event Hall in Oida, Japan. Tuesday, December 5th, WWE SmackDown Live is at the Valley View Casino Center in San Diego, California. If you attend these or any other professional wrestling events throughout the week, please send the results to prowrestlingalmanac at gmail.com. All right. And remember, folks, check out our website, prowrestlingalmanac.com. Follow us on Facebook, uh, Twitter, and on Instagram at PW Almanac. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and on iTunes, and then we can be heard on TuneIn Radio as well as Google Play. Uh, if you want to try to play Stump the Founder of prowrestlingalmanac.com, please send me your trivia to stumpthealmanac at gmail.com. Well, that's it, folks. The ref has given us the 10 count, which means we're done. So until next week, I'm Mike. And for Tristan, thanks for listening, and we'll see you again when the bell rings.